On behalf of the Ares Foundation, I'm pleased to present this Facebook Live session on breast reconstruction and breast cancer questions on things that we've all been asking questions about. And Ares is a great foundation that's a nonprofit that's uniquely uh, designed to actually provide women with access to breast reconstruction uh, after mastectomy. We advocate, we educate, and we support patients uh, that have had breast cancer by raising their awareness, building confidence, and also helping them through direct funding uh, and support of, of them throughout uh, their postoperative course. So we've received a lot of questions about COVID during this time of, of, of pandemic, and we're very pleased to have two outstanding breast cancer experts here from UT Southwestern. And uh, I want to first start with Dr. Deb Farr. Welcome. Uh, Deb is a uh, assistant professor in the Department of Plastic Surgery at UT Southwestern, and she's a surgical oncologist who specializes in surgical treatment of breast cancer. Uh, we're pleased to have you with us. And then uh, my good friend, Dr. Nicholas uh, Haddock, who's an associate professor of plastic surgery in, in, at UT Southwestern, who's a, who's a superb surgeon and expert in uh, microsurgery and breast reconstruction. So welcome, and thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. Thanks for having so, us. Glad to be here. Sir. Deb, I'm going to start with you as a breast cancer surgeon. So, so tell us about are you are you guys open and uh, how are you managing um, patients with breast cancer now? Yeah, we are definitely still seeing patients. Um, we have modified our practices um, based on the pandemic. We are doing a lot of virtual visits uh, for a lot of people that don't necessarily need to be examined. Um, people who uh, may progress to surgery during this time will have them come in and I will examine them in person. Um, we are operating a lot less though, however. Um, Governor, Abbott, Governor Abbott put in a, an executive order saying that um, anyone that we operate on has to be of medical necessity. Um, basically, um, anyone who we think that without this operation their, their disease would progress. Um, or would compromise um, their life. So our operations are basically just the, the acute ones. Yep, and and just so everybody knows, it, uh, both uh, Dr. Haddock and Far are actually at UT Southwestern Center of Breast Care, which is a phenomenal place. And uh, so let's just say, Deb, that uh, they they just got their breast cancer um, you know, diagnosis now from their primary care. And so mm -hmm. you initially do a virtual consult, and then how do you interface with Dr. Haddock, who's a breast, uh, who obviously will be doing the reconstruction if, if that's indicated. Huh? Tell us, just walk us through that. Yeah, so basically um, we will know uh, what type of cancer um, the, the patient has and the details of that before um, we'll set up a visit. If I believe that it's going to be a cancer that I will need to operate on sooner rather than later, I'll have them come into the office and I'll examine them. If they um, meet qualifications for having a mastectomy, then yeah. uh, we'll discuss kind of the options. Right now, we're not allowed to do any reconstructive surgery. So we'll discuss either doing a mastectomy um, now and having Dr. Haddock uh, reconstruct them later. Um, and it is a little bit different doing a mastectomy first and then having him reconstruct later. But that that is something that I've communicated with him on certain patients and I have every uh, confidence that he'll do a great yeah. job. It's just hard for patients to wait, and I understand that. Yeah, that's true. So Nicholas, how, so if they come to you directly, and obviously you're gonna, you're gonna send them to the breast center with Dr. Farr, how, how, do you, how do you approach them? Because you know, this is obviously, you know, it's breast cancer, so right. it's not truly elective. Yeah, so it's certainly not elective, and that's, that's what all the patients, of course, say, um, right. and rightfully so. Um, exactly. But in relation to the to what Deb said in the sense of the regulations currently, we as a department and as an institution made the decision not to do reconstruction. It, it is a yeah. little bit gray in the sense of what you can do, what you can't do. Um, and of course, this is Texas, so you know I, there may be other centers that are doing it a little bit differently. But we we are not doing any reconstruction currently. Um, and what I have offered uh to do is basically do telemedicine uh visits and and i i'll counsel the patients and you know it, that first consult as you know can be a pretty lengthy conversation right. and, and we're still able to have that whole conversation i think that's at least from the patients i've done it with i think it's been very helpful so so um, so basically nick so basically after uh, dev sees them and then she thinks they're a candidate and you're, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about when, when, which patients you would operate on COVID. But then you will do a virtual consult with them, 
uh, even though you can't do the reconstruction. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, I'll do a virtual consult regardless, okay. just at least to go through the options and That's talk great. about it. That's great. So, Deb, which which patients would you operate on? And then tell us about the COVID precautions, because patients have asked us, you know, am I have a bigger, bigger risk of getting COVID or infections? Tell us what you're doing. Obviously, you're doing all these strict guidelines. Will you help us with that? Sure. So the guidelines, um, multiple societies have given guidelines that are pretty parallel, basically, that we should only operate on those with disease that we think will, um, if we don't operate on them now, that it will progress or you know compromise their course. And so um, that tends to be based on the type of cancer that they have. Um, usually it's the, the triple negative uh, cancer patients, um, patients that are HER2 positive or that are at the conclusion of chemotherapy. And that's just a very rough kind of guideline. Um, and of course, it's very different based on each individual um, and their exceptions. For those exceptions, we usually speak with our multidisciplinary tumor board and get a consensus about what everybody thinks is necessary. If we do believe that it's necessary to take the patient to the operating room, um, we have a lot of different precautions that are in place. They're doing fever testing um, at the entrance of all the hospitals. Everybody is to wear masks at all times. Anesthesia is being very careful about um, intubation. Um, we're to leave the room after intubation, perform the surgery, and then we have to leave the room um, during extubation to minimize the aerosolization um, and encounter right of the virus. Um, everybody's being very careful with sterile precautions um, and the amount of staff that are uh, around is decreased to minimize the amount of uh, contact that everybody has. And so I think that we're being very responsible about keeping yeah. exposure risk to a low. Yeah, and I, I think it's good to hear what you said because it's a team decision, it's a team approach, like you always do something at the UT Southwestern Breast Center, which is phenomenal. So it's a team decision, especially now when, when you decide, are we going to do surgery? Are we going to do a mastectomy? Mm -hmm. And obviously the increased precautions, which you delineated so well. And the question has been also from a patient is that do, uh, what are my risks of getting COVID even with all these increased precautions that you have placed if I have to have a mastectomy? Well, the, the, the having cancer in and of itself does not increase your risk of getting the virus. The virus is still transmitted based on social contact, contact with someone that has the virus. Right. So we still encourage people to wash your hands, you know, social distance. Um, if someone has to go into the hospital and have surgery, um, then being at the hospital and having surgery itself does um, lower your immune system a little bit. Having surgery um, decreases your immune response. Um, however, we're getting people out of the hospital as quickly as possible, which is also part of the idea of not including surgery that's not necessary. Like we're not doing any prophylactic surgery and part of the choice not to do reconstruction is to minimize any other additional surgery that might increase their complications and keep them in the hospital. Yeah, that, that's a good follow-up question from somebody that said that how long, uh, how long do I have to stay in the hospital if I'm having a mastectomy? Because I don't want to be in the hospital. I mean, obviously they're mm -hmm. worried like all of us. Right, usually it's just overnight. Usually they can go really? home the next day and they do okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Then a question for you, Dr. Haddock, is this patient says, why do I have to wait? I'm having, I'm gonna have a mastectomy by Dr. Farr, but why do I have to wait to get a reconstruction? Why can't I just at least get an expander? Would, would you tell us what, what an expander is for people that yeah. don't know? So, uh, you know, often we use an expander, which is a temporary implant. Uh, it, co it goes in empty, and during the operation, we can fill it to, you know, a comfortable level for the patient. So the benefit it's there is, balloon. Yeah, it's like a balloon. Yeah. yeah, like a balloon. So it so it starts the reconstruction. It, the patient doesn't wake up flat. They wake up with some volume. And then that, that initiates the reconstruction. We can expand that to get more volume and ultimately shape the final reconstruction. It it's one of those things that we've kind of gone back and forth in a sense of discussion. Should we do them? Should we not do them now? And what Deb just said is probably a big part of the reason why we decided not to do them is because adding that device, a foreign object, does increase the risk right. of complications. And if we do that, if a patient has a complication, that means more trips to the med center, right. more, more potential inpatient stay, more potential surgery. And just having that risk in the current pandemic, we made the ultimate decision that it wasn't worth it. Yeah. No, I, I think that's very reasonable. And that's being a doctor first before a plastic surgeon. We always like that. Uh, but then another question that came up was, okay, so when COVID is over, when, uh, for both of you, when can I have my breast, my mastectomy and reconstruction? When, 
because I'm now going to be waiting six, eight weeks. And is that going to affect my survival? I mean, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a very tailored decision based on each patient's individual cancer. Um, and the answer, the honest answer right now is that we don't know um, because the True. date are getting pushed back. Keep changing. Um, it does. And I think that uh, we will make the decision as to uh, when we feel it's safe based on what we know at the time, um, based on where they are in their course of treatment. Um, if we believe that their disease is progressing, um, then uh, then we may take them to the operating room um, sooner than we had planned. Um, but we certainly won't engage in um, probably the reconstructive bit until we believe that it's safe. Okay. Nicholas? You. Yeah, I, I would echo the same thing. I mean, we we've kind of cleaned the OR schedule. We don't, I don't really have much at all for a while, but I do still have cases scheduled in the summer. Um, we don't know as this timeline keeps changing on a daily basis, but there's no question that when we get green light to move forward, we'll prioritize, at least from my perspective, I will prioritize the cancer patients and we'll get those patients and get the expanders placed and whatever we need to do, which unfortunately may mean some other people get moved around and things like that, but we're going to, we're going to, figure that out and do the best thing we can. Right. You know, and I think the other the question comes up. So how how long can I reasonably wait? And I guess this goes back to you, Deb, about how long can I reasonably wait? And and again, I, I, I mean, I, I know that's probably open ended, but yeah, what is reasonable? I mean, in ordinary times when you're very busy, two weeks, six weeks, I mean, you've had a, again, it depends on the type of cancer. But. Right. So right now um, we're doing as much medical therapy up front as we can so that we can delay the operation safely. Um, and of course, it's different based on every type of cancer. Uh, usually uh, after chemotherapy, we try to operate within about a month um, after the conclusion right. of chemotherapy. And that's outside of this uh, pandemic, that's usually a standard that, that we try to keep um, just so that they have enough time to recover from the chemotherapy um, and also be able to tolerate surgery without having more of a, a risk of the disease returning um, or progressing, I guess. So um, as a follow-up to that, so how long, what if you have to wait a couple of months after chemo? Because you really usually want to kind of do your mastectomy um, before then. Is that increase their recurrence or... Um, the, the answer is that it really depends on the, the different stage and the different type of cancer. I know it's, it's very tailored per person, but, um, but in general, we're, we're still, um, operating on people. We're trying to operate on people, um, at the conclusion of their, uh, that one month period, um, just so that we can sort of keep within those guidelines. And if they need a mastectomy at that time, then I'll do what I call a total mastectomy. Um, which is where I remove all the breast tissue um, and I don't save as much skin, which makes it a little bit harder for Dr. Haddock to do his reconstruction, but he's done it before. He'll, he'll do it again. He'll, and Nicholas, you want to tell him a little bit about how it's different when I do a total mastectomy first and then you have to reconstruct? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, when we talk about reconstruction, the big picture, there's two options. We have implants, we have the patient's own tissue. Um, right. And, you know, with implants, it certainly changes the starting point because we're flat now instead of having extra skin i can still start with that tissue expander we started but we won't be able to fill it at all it's going to remain flat and then in the office usually about three weeks later we come back we start filling that and we can still go down that path of implant reconstruction it's just a little bit maybe slower of a process and more expansion more visits are required with with the patient's own tissue it's a little bit different and really the patients that i've spoken to i've given them two options and one option would be to put in an expander like like we just talked about and then recreate kind of the breast envelope that way come back and do what we call a flap or a patient's own tissue for reconstruction right. and then that way we we maintain as much breast tissue scar pattern as less and such or we can skip that stage and just go directly to the flap what we would term a delayed flap and then the, the benefit there is one less surgery, but you have a larger patch of skin that's that's used to replace and give shape. And so those are really the simple, simplified options and, and kind of how we approach it. So here's another question about, uh, okay, what if uh, Dr. Farr does my breast, my mastectomy and I'm, and we have to wait two, three months. Does that make your reconstruction a lot more challenging, Nick? And also, does that change what you do? It's a good question. Uh, yeah, no, um, I can still, the only thing that changes my approach is if a patient needs radiation in between mastectomy and me doing reconstruction. 
Otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, the all the same options exist. It's just a longer process for the patient because we don't start it at that first surgery. And why does radiation make a difference? Radiation changes because it, it affects the skin envelope and the tissues that we use typically for reconstruction. And we have to, one, wait a while for that tissue to become uh, more appropriate and soften after radiation because it does get inflamed and tightened with radiation. So we generally wait about six months after that. To do the reconstruction. To do the reconstruction. Both and either then, with tissue expanders or with their own tissue? And then, and then with, with someone who's a delayed reconstruction and radiation, it's very hard to do just a straight two tissue expander. So we typically have to augment that with some of, uh, some of their own tissue. Okay. So back, back to you, Deb, what about the patient that, uh, okay, you do a mastectomy on, uh, can they proceed with radiation just like normal if, if you've deemed that they've actually need, needed to have it? Uh, yes, they are still doing radiation. Yeah. Um, uh, it, what we're trying to do is minimize the amount of encounters that someone has. So if they need um, multiple visits, usually radiation takes place every day where they come in every day. And right. get their um, because that's, you know, an exposure every day. What we're trying to do with patients in which it's appropriate is um, give them some type of medical therapy to, to bridge that gap. In other words, if they are an, an estrogen positive cancer and they have um, a need for radiation, we'll give them an estrogen blocker um, to sort of delay those daily treatments. Okay. In Good. That's a great point. So, um, so what about that patient? So you, you say they only have to stay usually one night in the hospital. That obviously is very beneficial to obviously ex minimize their exposure for other COVID and infections. Is that routine? Yeah, of course, everybody is a little bit different. Um, but certainly with uh, without the reconstruction, there are fewer variables. Um, and uh, we're pretty confident that usually people can go home the next day. Um, if they have any problems with their drains um, or any questions, um, the telehealth uh, practice has actually been really great because we can actually see what their incisions look like. We can look at their drain and see if they actually need to come in rather than over the phone. A lot of times you don't know if it's appropriate for them to come in. So it's given us that extra element of knowledge of being able to assess them without having to come in contact with them. Tell us about telehealth, both of you. How, how does that work for you? Because, you know, I think that's important. Uh, tell us about that. How, how do you do that? Well, for me, uh, what we do is um, we have um, an encounter um, that's set up uh, via our secure Epic link. Um, and it's myself and my nurse um, in an exam room or in an office, so it's private. Um, and we're able to interface with the patient just like you and I are interfacing. Exactly. So I'll be able to, I'll be able to ask them questions. Um, and although I won't be able to examine them, a lot of times I can get a lot of information just by seeing their body habitus or seeing um, characteristics of the breast that would change my need for surgery or the type of surgery that I would do. Right. And also the need for you to actually see them in person, correct? Exactly. So, all right. Yeah, so Nicholas, tell us about how you do it. Yeah. yeah, we're we're in the same system. So in a sense of it's a secure in our electronic medical record. Um, but, you know, the, the thing is, is now that we're all getting comfortable with this, I think it's going to impact us. And a lot of people are saying this going forward. So I, I had a telehealth. I had a visit with someone today in West Texas that, you know, has a huge drive to come in and talk to her, looked at incisions. Everything looks fine. And that's good. Um, we've gone to the extent it's with some patients that are even that are far away like that of walking them through removing their own drains and things like that. Yep. So it's I mean, it's changed the way we're managing people yep. and it certainly made it easier for them, yep. easier for everyone. So, well, let's talk about let's talk about some pause. Let's, you know, let's talk about some positive things, because I, I have seen the same thing with my patients. I mean, it's amazing what you can see without actually doing hands-on. And, and actually this is, kind of, I think this is fast forwarding patient post-op follow-up and care, because as we know, we live in Texas. So our West Texas patients, they'd come and see us every week and they'd drive four or five hours. Mm -hmm. Isn't that yeah. amazing? Yep. I just find it amazing. But but I, so let's talk about some of the positive things about, about this that actually make it better. Uh, Deb, let's start with you and then Nick can continue. What? Yeah, I think that it's, um, it's definitely increased communication be between providers um, now that, <laughs> We we're also used to Zoom and um, and telehealth and FaceTime. Um, sure. We're all here to talk to each other because you know we're we're social distancing. Um, I think that there's a lot more collaboration um, and everybody's very much on the same page about what we would like to do with these patients. Um, with our patients, I think they they feel more comfortable calling um, and asking questions and 
us being able to see them, um, they they feel more confident that they're being taken care of um, and that they're effectively communicating what they need with us. Um, for patients that um, I used to see patients back like every week um, to right. see how they're doing, like check a wound or something like that. Um, patients now, I can just check in on them a quick five minute visit and say, you know what, you don't need to come in until, or I don't need to see this for like another couple of days. And that saves them a trip. It saves everybody time. Um, Are you going to change, change it after COVID? I'm sorry? Are you going to change it? Are you going to keep doing the Zoom after COVID? I think so. I think it's pretty right. effective. It's very time saving. I totally agree. I, I definitely am. I actually like it. And uh, especially at least, I mean, I think it's a permanent change. Nick, what do you think? Uh, you know, and obviously in plastic surgery, we're very hands-on and our yeah. patients really are needy. And I mean, I'm talking about the non-breast cancer <laughs> patients, you know, they, yeah. they really want to see you, but honestly, it's, well, I'll let you guys talk and I'll tell you my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I echo everything that Deb just said. Um, I do think it's, it's created collaboration or we already had collaboration, but it's strengthened the collaboration between everybody. Yeah. And since, you know, when you start talking about not doing surgery and delaying surgery, there's a lot of discussion that goes in to make those decisions. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we all have to be on the same page and you know, all of that. So there's no question that's happened. Um, it, you know, we, I just gave the story of a patient, you know, this morning and, and, you know, not having patients come in and, and, you know, I think that's better for everyone, right? It's better for not, you know, not having people come into the practice and right. better for them. They're not driving. Mm -hmm. um, from my practice, I, you know, we'll see how laws and whatnot change. Because right now everything's kind of wide open and we can treat people kind of wherever they are, even out right. of state. And that that's a little bit of gray. So we'll see what happens after all of this. But, you know, I do some unique, uh, you know, free flaps for breast right. reconstruction. I have a decent number of out of state, as I'm sure you have a lot of out of state patients. Yes. Telemedicine, are you treating them? You know, where are you treating them? And I think it brings up a whole nother question that we have to kind of sort out. But it, there's no question it would make my life easier to manage a patient that lives in Kansas, you know, right. over telemedicine, you know, if if this remains available afterwards, like we're doing now. Oh, it should. I, I mean, for me, it's been a yeah. game changer. I've always done virtual consults. Half my patients come from around the world, so it, mm -hmm. it's great. And But it's increased my follow-ups dramatically. And actually, yeah. I like it. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very much more focused. So am I. Mm -hmm. um, but that does bring up a question I have also about, so what if the patient wants to see the two of you together? Can they Zoom with the two of you together now? Can they Can they do that? Let's just say, I want to see Dr. Haddock at the same time, and I want to discuss this. And mm -hmm. Can you guys do that? We haven't yet, but I mean, heck, we've done a lot yeah. of things that, you know, yeah. we didn't think that we would do, you know, three years ago. So um, I'm sure that we could figure it out. Yeah. it. I mean, there's no question it exists because, uh, you know, I, when I do my visits, um, you know, the new patients I'm not necessarily examining, but any post-ops, I'm, I'm doing a chaperoned exam. Sure. I'm at home doing this. My nurse is at home logging in. Right. So there's no question. You can have as many people as you wanted to invited to the party, but, you know, just yeah. like that. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And I think, uh, you know, some forms of, of Zoom are compliant, some are not. In fact, there's been some things with that. But, I mean, the good thing is, you know, obviously Epic at UT is very compliant, and I think people need to know that. And it's, you know, and I think it's going to change how I envision, you know, like my Zoom room now is my office at, in my, uh, well, it's at home, but it, it's a, it will be the office at, at, in my office. So, mm -hmm. And I think it, it's probably going to be the same thing for you all. There'll be a, a secluded Zoom room where mm -hmm. you'll be there with your nurse and uh, because, you know, you're, you're examining, you know, the post-op, the incisions, the breast. So mm -hmm. the other thing is you can record it and take photos too. And I think and with the patient's permission, right. that's actually been really good. And it's, it's actually saved me a lot of time, even before COVID, of saying, I don't need to see you. I can just, I, I know what you have. Mm -hmm. and I think, so I think those are positive things. What other things do you think are good that coming out of this? Because I know everybody's apprehensive. Mm -hmm. We're going to get through this. But what are, what are the positive things that I think are going to come out of this in the management of the breast cancer patient? That I think that we're going to, a couple different things. I think that we're going to learn a little bit more about um, what therapies and in what order we can do them. I think we'll gain a lot of data based on the patients that right. um, now a little bit differently, and we're certainly going to study those. Um, I think it's great that there are conversations um, around the country already about collecting data about um, you know the way that everybody manages patients um, individually and seeing those trends, um, which may make people um, feel a little bit more comfortable about delaying surgery in the future if they need to. Um, getting second opinions, you know, those types of things can be, uh, can delay 
care, right? The other thing that I think um, is great in terms of, since we're at an academic center, I work a lot with the residents um, and we're doing a lot of virtual education. And so just this week, we're doing two journal clubs for breast, um, just because you know, they, they have the time and the interest. Um, our conferences are much better attended over Zoom. Just, uh, I think you were saying, Dr. Rourke, that you did grand rounds and had a, an outstanding attendance um, because you know everybody's interested in, in right. talking with each other and sort of, even if we can just interact um, electronically, it's better than you know sitting at home alone. So I think that the residents also are banding together and have really mm -hmm. stepped up and have been really inspiring as to how willing they are to to pitch in um, and to work together on this. So I've been incredibly inspired by all of our residents and the colleagues that I work with to put together not only these guidelines, but to really support each other in the decisions that we're making to take care of these patients. Yep. Well said. Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I, I would echo the same thing. Um, she's more on the front of the delaying of surgery and, and those aspects, but, but from a just spread of knowledge, you know, we're having grand rounds and not just uh, every center, as you said, you were doing a grand rounds earlier, yeah. they're all becoming electronic and right. opening That's it cool. up for as many academic centers as they want to, to bring in. It's, it's so the spread of knowledge with this, no reason why that should stop. If someone's given a great talk somewhere, it should be available to everyone. Right. You know, and it's kind of opening that door. Yeah, I know. I mean, I did I did Duke's grand rounds yesterday, and I didn't know I had there was Emory, Wake Forest, and UNC. Right. It was right. <laughs> so, well, you know, you'd never get that in reality. You know that, that nobody drive yeah. up to Duke. Right. To, but, but it's good. So, what about okay? The question I also had is, what about okay? I'm, I have to wait six eight weeks. So what's the backlog? I mean, I mean, are you having so how am I how am I going to feel? Am I going to be sequenced in if, if my cancer is a little worse do i get moved up or how, tell us about that because there's a lot of concern about okay like especially you guys are very busy at ut for breast cancer so how how are you going to make up for that are you going to be working saturdays or how are you going to get my how are you going to get our patients in yeah nicholas and i have definitely operated on saturdays before so um i think that we'll do whatever we need to do to get the okay. patients in based on their need um the people that uh have you know a a, um, a more controllable cancer that is able to be delayed will, will probably be on the back end. The people that have um, the more advanced um, cancers uh, that need surgery uh, more urgently up front will definitely be at the beginning. And I anticipate being very busy when we first start doing this. And we've certainly right. shifted our calendars around and making sure that we can be available. Nicholas has always been great about making himself available, um, you know, whenever we need to fit someone in for a reconstruction um, or basically it'll be based on what the patient's need is. Right. Yeah. And then I'll just add, uh, you know, they are, for, I was in a meeting yesterday, we're talking about extending block times, you know, having the ORs run later into the night and right. opening up Saturday and Sunday with, you know, a handful of rooms or as many as needed you know, to kind of, you know, backlog and catch up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, I agree. And we're, we're definitely going to, as soon as we get the green light and it's safe, obviously it's going to be a different uh, standard. You know, our, we have to protect our staff, like you said, yeah. and the anesthesiologists. I mean, the because, you know, that intubation, extubation is a huge mm -hmm. time. And I think just so the public knows that there's a time for turnover, you have to turn over the oxygen, the air in the room, depending, mm -hmm. it goes from five minutes to 20 minutes in different ORs. And you have to allow that to clear before you allow the personnel to go back. We all have to wear a specialized mask, which hopefully will not be an issue. But you know, as as we protect the patient, we have to protect the, um, you know, our uh, the healthcare workers as well, which are the front line here. So, mm -hmm. what 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 do you tell patients now while they're waiting to you know, because you know, if they have a diagnosis of breast cancer. You know, obviously they're a little bit more immune compromised. What do you tell them uh, while they're waiting to have mastectomy or reconstruction? What, what do you what do you say to them? What they should do if if they're not going to be a candidate, they have to wait. What do you tell them to do at home? I tell them to stay home and <laughs> and to you know to social distance, to wash their hands. You know, try and um, be as responsible as possible in terms of. Um, not getting the virus, you know, because that will definitely, um, that will make their treatment harder. Um, it depends on what treatment we put in place to delay them. A lot of them are on an estrogen blocking medication. And so right. 
We're still monitoring them um, in terms of getting labs and making sure that they're safe on that medication. The patients who are on chemotherapy um, is a, a special type of patient, and they are certainly immunocompromised. Absolutely. Um, and they are you know, taught to take extra precautions as well, and our medical uh, oncology colleagues have done an excellent job with keeping them right. safe and minimizing their visits and making sure that they, um, they're monitored so that they are sure that we don't have progression of disease on this medication mm -hmm. and so that if we need to operate sooner, then we will. Right, and I think the key thing is wear a mask. Yes. Mask for all. I mean, the, the CDC finally made the right decision after all of that waxing and waning, because we know in the countries where there's less COVID and the countries that have, have survived it and are now back, they wear masks to protect themselves, but also others. And that that has actually slowed the curve in so many. And I think they need to wear a mask, uh, especially in their public places. And they you know probably should have their, their um, better half or go to the grocery store you know, and have yeah. them stay at home, but wear a mask, I think. And uh, Nicholas, exactly. any other comments on that? I mean, because these yeah, are- I, I mean, the, the truth is, is I think we tell them what we tell everyone else, right? I mean, we're all supposed to be doing these things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So not everybody listening. All, not everyone's listening, but everyone <laughs> should be. And that's how we flatten the curve and, and you know, get, get on the other side of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. I mean, it's amazing because the day before the, the presidential commission talked about not wearing a mask, I went to the grocery store and hardly anybody. Then the two days after, everybody was having a mask. Mm -hmm. So, but I've been wearing a mask for two weeks, you know, and, you know, it's, it goes from people avoiding it to say, oh, that's normal now. Because, you know, in our yeah. culture, we don't wear masks, but in other cultures, right. it's normal. So it's a yeah, good idea. It's new normal. Right. It is. Not, and, and, and it's the new normal. It's like uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Fauci said yesterday, we may not go back to handshaking. Maybe right. maybe that's true. Maybe we just do the bow or the namaste. I, I don't know, but I think things are going to be different. I definitely yeah. think it's going to be different. So, uh, but what about okay? So, what are the things that would you tell your patients, uh, Deb, th right now uh, when they're actually in the process? Uh, and you know, they they haven't had. They're very worried. They've had their. Uh, uh, they can still they can still get biopsies to rule out breast cancer. Can they not? I mean. Yes. Or so, if yeah, it's, it's a mammogram, do I have to wait? I mean, and, and you know, like if it's a mammogram that's very suspicious and they've been told by their radiologist, you know, you really need to go see, you know, you uh, and they can't. I mean, t what do you tell those patients? So um, it's a little bit different. So we're not doing um, the screening like we did before for like, you know, patients who are in for their annual mammogram. So usually what happens is that a, a woman feels a lump. Um, right based on suspicion, then um, we can work those patients up. Um, of course, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if we believe that that lump you know, could be correlated to a mammogram that they had in the past and we feel like it um, it may be benign, we might say, you know, we may want to wait a little bit, a couple weeks to see if you know we work that up. However, the women that I've been seeing um, have skin changes or a symptom like nipple discharge, or they have, you know, a lump in their, in their armpit and their axilla. Those are the women that we want to, to biopsy and, um, make sure that they start some, some type of treatment. And, and those are the ones you would see, right? Nipple discharge, uh, depression. Tell, yeah, us, so, tell us about that. Uh, so seeing these patients in the office, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So if I believe that I'm going to either, uh, need to yeah. operate on them up front or um, put in a port. We usually uh, a port for chemotherapy. Usually, we um, we like to make sure that we have a good idea of what we're starting out with. Right. And so, um, if they're going to start chemotherapy, um, of course, we're going to want to do um, staging workup and that type of thing. But in terms of the exam, I need to sort of figure out uh, what it, does the cancer present like at the beginning. And for that to happen, um, I need to do an exam. And so I will see patients in the office and I will do an exam. Um, and that's important for, um, for clinical staging in the axilla purposes if they need further biopsies, if they're going to, um, to be a candidate for a partial mastectomy or if, you know, I think a, a mastectomy is more appropriate. So there is still a lot of value in the physical exam um, for people yeah. who I think that can wait. If they're anxious, if they have questions, call me. We can always, you know, talk over telehealth. And if they're anxious about what's going to happen with the reconstruction, I know that Nicholas has been great about walking them through how it's going to be a little bit different now. Okay. Also, there's a question here. This is from a patient, I guess, in another part of the country, but she has a complication after her breast reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how, how is she supposed to manage uh, seeing her plastic surgeon? And it's, in this case, it's a recurrent seroma. And obviously, seroma is when the fluid reaccumulates. So 
if I know you don't have those things, but if you, how would you manage that patient that you, those you physically have to see it, tell us about how you would manage that. Yeah. So, you know, seroma during this time, I think it has to be managed. Um, but the, you know, you try and still do minimal, you know, care. So I, those patients are probably not going to go to the operating room right now, but right. you should You'll be able to drain them. it in the office. Yeah. You'll see them drain it in the office. If there's an implant or something, the the breast center or the imaging centers can still do an do a ultrasound guided drainage or something, right. something along those lines. All of that can be done as an outpatient, but so the patients are seen, taken care of, um, you know, and, and unfortunately sometimes, it, you know, it sounds like this is a recurrent. So if, if these things continue to be a problem, then sometimes the final step is an operative treatment, but that's probably not going to happen at this time. Yeah. It's going to continue this kind of outpatient management. Yeah. I, I think the thing people all want to know is that, you know, we're there, you know, we're, we're right. health providers, we're at the front lines, we're there for them. If they need us, you know, before the surgery, after surgery, if there's a problem, we're there. We're not, there's no abandonment. And plus, I think with telehealth, you can actually see them almost immediately versus when you're yeah. so busy. So, and then you, if you physically see them, you'll wear the mask and all of the protocol. I think that, I think that's a big thing that really has people concerning about that. So, but yeah, um, I, I have office hours every, every day now. Whereas before, I, of course, did not. I was in the operating room, so it's um, a little more open. Right. You're right. So you're much – same here. You know, I'm, I mean, yeah. I'm doing uh, – between grand rounds and all these things, I'm actually – I'm doing more uh, post-op follow-ups than, than I ever did before because, you know, yeah. we're surgeons. You know, we're right. not used to just hanging around. That's the thing is that, if, you know, yeah. patients say, like, it's so hard to wait. And I'm like, I know. I feel the same <laughs> way. It's hard for us to wait and not operate. It's really yeah. difficult. So we're yeah. right there with you. Yeah, and I think the other thing, and just tell me, I mean, obviously, I, I do a lot more elective surgery, because, but the people are actually much more understanding because it's not like, this is a pandemic. It's not a Texas or it's a yeah. world problem. So haven't you seen that? I mean, even in patients that, you know, that have breast cancer, I mean, they have to understand, they understand that, you know, we're all in this together. Yeah, I think that my breast cancer patients have always been people that, you know, inspire me very commonly with, you know, how brave they are and, you know, how right. um, they're, you know, they're, they're seeing this as, you know, some patients um, are amazing. They say, you know, this has an, actually been a blessing. I've learned so much about life and what's important and that type of thing. Um, they continue to be amazing in that, you know, they're saying, you know, I, I realize I might not be first in line and that's okay. Like I want, you know, the greater good to prevail. And it's, it's awesome to see. Good. Yeah. I, I get the same sentiment from, from nearly everybody it's uh, it's pretty impressive because i i no question empathize or sympathize with you know patients going through this right now it's a it's an uncertain time for all of us right but. it is i mean it's unprecedented so the other question i had is okay while i'm waiting what 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 resources could i look at to learn about you know the different types of mastectomy and also the different types of reconstruction what 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 do you, what do you send your patients to in normal times but honestly like like us now, we have a lot more time. So Deb, we'll start with you. So what, what resources can I read if I have breast cancer and I want to kind of, before I even see you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we give the patients um, a lot of literature um, for virtual visits. We're actually not handing them something, but we usually direct them to the American Cancer Society. That's um, probably the most reliable source that we have right now. Um, I think uh, when we're talking about patients and, you know, what will increase or decrease the, their anxiety. A lot of times I say, you know, um, if you have questions about the type of mastectomy or what you would be a candidate for, why or why not, that's something that um, we would love to talk to you about um, in these virtual visits. Um, while a lot of information online can be very helpful, a lot of it can be misleading. Um, and so right. I don't want a patient, you know, seeing something or reading something and misunderstanding their course of care and then increasing their anxiety. So um, I think that the, the literature that we have with the American Cancer Society is awesome. If they have any questions, then that's absolutely when we should take advantage of the telehealth and you know talk to them about what exactly they're a candidate for. Right. And then Nicholas? Yeah, I, I tend to control it to my personal website, to be honest. Um, no, I, I think that's a good thing. And, and I, yeah. I, I, looked at your, I looked at your website and I think it's great. They need, because you have a very good explanation of the different types of reconstruction. And, uh, and, uh, and also we parallel that with a lot of the things that we put in airsfoundation.org. It's got all the same things. It talks about right. breast reconstruction and breast cancer management. So I, I think that's a good thing because there's a lot of time now. There was a question here also about, okay, what if I have COVID? 
how long do I have to wait? I have breast cancer. I have COVID. How long do I have to wait before I get my mastectomy and reconstruction? That's actually a great question. I, so right now, um, we're, uh, so they would probably, the COVID would be the first priority for them. Um, right. If we add on like a, a an estrogen blocker during that time, right. um, that would be something that we would try to do. But the priority would be basically treating their virus. Usually what we say is um, that if they have the virus, they've been tested and they're positive, then um, usually we wouldn't try to start anything else or engage with them um, until they're fever free for 72 hours. Right. So um, what about then, surgery? That's a very good, I, what's surgery the surgery would, operate you know, on that? would still be based upon the type of cancer that they have. Um, I don't think that we would operate on anyone. Um, of course, there are always exceptions, and I'm sure that if I sat here long enough, I could think of one. Um, but I don't think that uh, we would try to operate on anyone who actively has the virus. No, I know that. But let's just say I had it. I've th I'm, I'm three days out, and I mean, would you wait a week, two weeks, two weeks? I mean, I, I mean honestly, I, I actually don't know the answer to that question either. Yeah. Uh, but we all know that after theoretically after 20, 48 to 72 hours, that you can you're theoretically not. I mean, there's some data to say that you're not at least infect, infecting others and that mm -hmm. the malaise and everything may exist. Mm -hmm. But I don't know the data on uh, when you could operate on them, you know, doing elective well, or semi-elective. Yeah. I, I don't think anyone does. I, I think that we're trying to be tested. Yeah. What did you say, Nicholas? Should, I was just saying, should they be tested, right? So, right. you know. Should, should they have antibodies? So they have it. So let's just say they've had it. They're asymptomatic and they have... And they're tested and they have antibodies and so actually but they're back i mean it seems reasonable to do it i, I don't know you know waiting several weeks i mean because you want the patient to be back because so many times they have at least from what i've read a lot of they have a lot of muscle aches for a week or two and they're not back to themselves and their appetite and they many of them lose weight too so yeah, yeah, several weeks but i honestly i don't think we have an answer do we i don't think we do and i think that the virus affects everybody a little bit differently exactly. you know exactly you know, there are some people that are, you know, that are very, very sick and have, you know, they're on the ventilator with pulmonary complications and other people, it's like a really bad flu. And so it would really depend right. on the, the type yeah. of um, the type right. of symptoms that they had and the sequela from this. Yeah, I think it brings up also the safety thing for the patient, but also for the healthcare provider, because I think when we come back, we're going to have to do all those things, you know, the ventilation, the N95, but also I think, I think uh, eventually we're going to, well, I think we'll be having mandatory testing for COVID for all of us and probably the development of antibodies for healthcare workers. I mean, they're talking preliminary about that, but mm -hmm. I don't, I think that's a real gray area. I, I don't know. I mean, I think electively, if I was going to do a rhinoplasty on a COVID patient, I'd probably wait a few months, but, mm -hmm. but you don't have that, you don't Cancer, have that yeah. privilege. I mean, you don't have that luxury, right? With certain cancers we could, with it, it really depends on the type of cancer. Right. So yeah. Right. If they have a cancer that we could delay them safely that way, I'm, I'm sure that we would definitely consider that. But if they're more acute, then we would that would be a case for our multidisciplinary team to discuss and figure out yeah, what the best exactly. is. Well, and this goes back to that that collaboration and you know our anesthesia colleagues who get them involved because right. you know certainly they're managing their way the you know all of the things that are that are typically affected with COVID. So yeah, there's no and there's a high risk. That. They're at high risk. They're, no question. They're at no. high risk and. Um, but if the patient has an antibody, and these are all things that I keep questions about is, if they have antibodies, uh, that actually is a potentially a good thing. And that's why healthcare workers, much like we today have to have H Hep B antibodies, mm -hmm. we eventually, once we get, until we get herd immunity and, and a vaccine, I think healthcare workers are at much increased risk. Yeah. Because we're on the front line in all of these patients. Yeah. So, um, but uh, no, that's great. And then, um, then there was another question here about okay, so what if I um, and on am on immunotherapy and um, mm -hmm. I'm on chemo and I get COVID? What is obviously uh, well, what those are at increased risk. Tell us about have you had a patient like that, Deb? I have not. Um, I I would hope that no one would ever be in that situation, but um, that would definitely be. Um, something that our medical oncology uh, colleagues would speak to. Um, me on the surgical side, usually I see them before and then after chemotherapy, I'm not usually um, intimately involved with their care during that chemotherapy period. So that would be more of a question for one of our medical oncologists, but right. that would be that would be terrible. Hopefully no yeah. one's in that boat. Yeah, 
No, I agree. Nicholas, I, I agree. I think that's what the beauty of the UT Southwestern Breast Center. I mean, it's phenomenal. And, you know, two, three, four heads are better than one, mm -hmm. especially. And this is this is evolving knowledge, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us know. Right. Yeah, we, we have these conversations and, and we'll hear someone say, oh, this is atypical of COVID. It's like, do we, do we really know yeah. what's typical, what's atypical? Yeah. Everything know, changes. It. I mean, look at our healthcare mandates yeah. changes. Take the mask. How often did that change? Right. right. So I don't think we can be so dogmatic yet. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be safe for the patient and safe for the healthcare provider. Yeah. So I, I, my answer to that would be, I think they need to come see you guys and be evaluated. And, um, yeah. and obviously testing, testing is going to be paramount. And then the absence or presence of antibodies is paramount mm -hmm. uh, for their safety and, of course, for yours as well. So right. that's great. Um, but I think, um, you know, that, and then there's, there's a, there's a great app that actually it's called breast advocate app too. That's actually great. There's a lot of information. I think what you mentioned and the American cancer society, American college of surgery, uh, you know, next website is awesome. Uh, and then all, all our societies have really, really good websites. But I think, I think the key is you have to go to a breast care, breast center. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a strong advocate in, in specialty care, especially when you're having breast cancer. And especially now with COVID, yeah. I think uh, this is not the time for the Lone Ranger. You know, this is a team approach. Um, yeah, we always say that breast cancer, it, you know, it's, it is a team sport. You know, it takes a village yeah. and everybody needs to be on the same page. And so that's why it's really great to work with colleagues that, you know, are so communicative and really out for the yeah. patient's best interest. Yeah, no, my patients love it. They love, they love you guys. I mean, I. I have so many patients that, I, of course, you know, I've been at UT, was at UT for many years, so it's fantastic. So um, any other closing comments that you would like to make on behalf of uh, uh, of our, you know, breast cancer patients, breast reconstruction patients um, that you'd like? I'll start with you, Deb, and then Nicholas. Um, I would just say if you have any questions, reach out. We're here to support you, um, and we're going to do the best thing that we can for each and every patient, um, and we are available. So if you have any questions or concerns or, you know, every case is a little bit different, so we'd be more than happy to to talk to you and to figure out what's best. And we have both your website e email as well as your phone number, actually, that will be on, on this on the air site. And Nicholas? Yeah, I, I would echo the same thing. It's, you know, I, I don't think patients should feel abandoned during this time. And, exactly. and, you know, know that we are available. We're still here to take care of them. We may not see them, you know, in the office every day, but but we're certainly happy to talk, counsel, guide. And, you know, I that's critical for people to know that we're, we're still here. And, and then, you know, we have this kind of, you know, team approach and we bounce each other, you know, ideas and things. And, that's critical for them to know and, and helpful. Yep. And I think that's the sign of best care. You know, I think best care comes from team approach. And I think you guys epitomize that. So, so I think, uh, you know, and also the AIRS website has all this information. We'll have this web, this webinar also on it's airsfoundation.org. You can apply for a grant. We obviously uh, do so many grants for patients that cannot afford breast reconstruction. And, uh, and th these folks have been so helpful in, in doing so in the healthcare system and at Parkland, which of course is probably one of the best, if not the best county hospital in the world. I'm a little biased, but I think it is. And then donations to support the foundation can be made online well. And of course, check on Facebook. The next one we're gonna do is also gonna be with an advocate and a survivor next week. So so on behalf of Ayers, uh, uh, Deb and Nicholas, thank you so much for taking time out of your uh, your practice in live and, uh, and really educating us and the public about these important things on breast cancer and breast cancer care. So Thanks for having us. Thank you. you. My pleasure and enjoy. Thank you. Bye-bye.